Platin Umba 2042. I'm going to start playing different openings, by the way. Now, let's continue playing the King's Indian, though. No, Rook E8 is not senseless. You have the F8 square there. It, again, with a close position, you can move back to F8. Okay, so we have a King's Indian. Castles. And uh, E5. This is the main line. This is the main line of the King's Indian. And my opponent now, we're playing serious people. He plays the Petrosian Variation. The Petrosian Variation is where White immediately pushes D5. After the game, I will talk a little bit about King's Indian theory. Now, one of Black's main ideas in this position is to put the Knight on C5. The move D5 has weakened the C5 square, and from that square, black can attack E4. But there is a problem. If you put the knight on C5 prematurely, white can chase it away with a move B4. So a very typical King's Indian move is to play A5, preventing B4 and preparing to deploy the knight to C5, either via D7 or via A6. Okay, Pro this is basically prophylaxis. It also grabs space on the queen side. And that's good as a standalone phenomenon. Now, what is the main plan here for either side? White prepares the queen side attack and black attacks on the king side. What does it mean to attack on the king side here? There is one very typical idea that basically starts out all king's Indian attacks on the queen side. Could somebody spell out this idea for me? Now, let's be general though. It's to move the knight and then to push the F pawn out to F5. But we don't just want to shove the knight anywhere. We want to put the knight on a square where it also does something. And one very typical maneuver is to go knight h5 with an eye toward going knight f4. We don't need to go knight f4 immediately. But that's something we can keep an eye on. But wait a minute. Let's support the knight on c5 first before we go f5. How can we do that? How can we make sure that, you know, this knight is very nicely supported before we play f5? Another typical King's Indian move, we can play the move b6. Very patient. Very patient move. And now I'm going to show you something kind of cool. So white is threatening before. He's not actually threatening it, and I'll show you guys that too after the game. How can we prevent that? We can play a4. But wait, I hear you saying, and he probably is going to, and that's a mistake. We give up a pawn. Have we blundered it? No, we haven't. We've sacrificed it. Why have we sacrificed it? Because of something called the dark squares. Now, how can we exploit the dark squares in the fastest possible way? Not the b-file, the dark squares. What can we now do? What move is possible? Knight of four is typical, but I want something nicer. Bishop h6. This, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is a, another very typical king. We are setting up some beautiful ideas. We are actually threatening checkmate, which he just missed. It is already checkmate. And we can actually... Ooh. So there is a utilitarian mate. But let me show you guys... Okay, so, so bishop e3 check... And let me think. So what's the simplest move? Of course, the simplest is to play queen h4 and knight g3 check. Do you guys want me to do it? Do you guys want me to show you something really cool? We're going to do this. Let's, yeah. And what is my idea? I will, I, will, I will show you everything. What is, nope, not queen h4. It's not queen h4. What do you always need to check when you have a two move idea? What happens? If I play the second move first, boom goes the dynamite. And after he takes, queen g5 and checkmate is unstoppable. Now, I didn't invent any of this. I've seen it before. I will explain everything. Now, I know that not everybody plays the King's Indian, and that's why the premise of the speedrun is not to fixate on openings. Because I'm respectful of the fact that people play different openings. So I'll try to keep things relatively brief opening-wise, but I highly recommend the King's Indian, anybody who's an attacking player. Okay, so first of all, to recap, right, e5. e5 does not blunder the pawn, because if we take the pawn, or let's say th this is the exchange variation, this is a viable line. But to take the pawn here is not a good idea, because it allows knight takes e4, exposing the attack on the knight. Takes, and bishop takes e5. One very important detail. White can try the desperado sacrifice, knight takes f7, and if we take the knight, white's going to end up a pawn up. What can black do here to refute this? Who can, who can tell me how black refutes this? Without this, the king's Indian would not have existed. Mm -hmm. A c5 is viable, but that's the more Benoni-like approach. Bishop c3 and king f7. Nicely done, guys. So that's the, the tactical reason the king's Indian works. He goes d5. He defines the center immediately. This is called the Petrosian variation. After Tigran Petrosian, the main line is to castle. And here, actually, 
Black has the additional option of taking on d4. Rare line, but I like it. And uh, we won't delve into this right now. But he goes d5. So a5, right? Stopping b4. Then we get the knight to c5. And now by playing f3, he has cut contact with the h5 square. So in the King's Indian, generally, there's three ways of preparing f5, right? You can step away to e8 and then go f5 and then go back to f6. You can go to d7, although this is more rare, but this does have the benefit of supporting the knight. It does, however, block the bishop. Sometimes you can even go king h8, knight g8. Kasparov patented this idea in numerous five gifted subs of the community. Keeps that 3 a.m. hype going, 4 a.m. hype going. Thank you, Inumeris, for five gifted to Midnight Rhino, Lasargic Die, Walrus Punk, Fabs, and J. Curtis. Loving it, loving it, loving it. Okay. Um, so we go knight h5. He goes bishop e3, b6, and a3. Has a Foco. Thanks for the tier one. Now let's, let me first explain why in like a Grandmaster game I would not have gone a4. So if we go f5, and he goes b4. Black is a very cool idea. Now, how do you gauge the success of b4? You gauge the success of b4. If the knight has to move somewhere like blech or blech, then white's going to get c5 in and this is successful. Could anybody tell me how black can respond to the move b4 in a very good way? And this actually is a typical King's Indian idea. It's not f4. f4, he can just drop the bishop back. I'll give you a hint. Takes. Takes. And now what additional pretty maneuver does black have? And, and that look at this beautiful juicy knight on d4. This actually helps black. So this is a very important subtle idea for King's Indian experts to know. But I played a4 to illustrate a concept. Now, first of all, why do we stop b4? Because we cannot piss on him. But he immediately sees the pawn and takes it, right? If he goes f4, then we will take it. And now look at this beautiful bishop and look at this outpost on e5. This is generally what happens. Does that make sense? So he takes the pawn immediately and we play bishop h6, deploying the bishop. And look at these dark squares all around white's king. That's the importance of squares. You know, when you weaken a whole complex of squares like this, you're going to be in big trouble. Bishop b3 is basically an unstoppable threat. If he tries to stop it with queen b3, what simple tactical motif does black have? And this basically transposes the, into the game. Yeah, rook takes. Bishop b3. And if he covers it, we can go queen h4, g3. Oops, sorry, not queen g3, but knight g3. Uh, and this is absolutely crushing. Okay. Many top players of King's Indian experts, including Hikaru, he's played some brilliant games. Queen b3. So that's what would have happened there. He goes b4, unaware of what's about to befall him. Now, bishop b3. Why is rook takes a4 necessary? We use the technique of thinking backwards to find rook takes a4. We begin by asking, why can I not do this? Followed by queen g5, threatening queen h6. Who can tell me? What defensive resource white has? It doesn't save the game. White will still be lost. But who can smell and sniff out how white prolongs the game? F4 is correct. And bishop h5. And of course, taking with the queen here wouldn't be impossible. You could take on a4 now and win. But white's not going to take the rook. That's going to be obvious. But thinking backwards, we say, wait a second. If white's queen could be made to disappear from d1, then this would be checkmate because h5 would not be defended by the queen, right? Um, so, oh, and by the way, I see why I was unable to find games uh, in, in chess space. So as you guys are thinking, I am going to make another search here to show you guys if I can find any um, ideas here. Okay, I found a couple. Yeah, so we, we therefore take on a4 first, forcing the queen out, and now we give a check. Of course, queen h4 would have been winning. In fact, it would not be checkmate immediately. He could try to go h3, but this would be a very straightforward mate in a couple moves. Right, definitely don't trade the dark square bishop. Now, that doesn't mean you never do this, but you can see the danger of weakening a complex of squares. White should have gone knight d3 here, but still, knight b3, knight d4, and black is better. So against the Averbach, I'm getting a question about a very specific line of the king's Indian. 
Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to try not to stray too deeply into theoretical waters, but the Aberbrack is where white develops the two bishops first. And what I do here is queen to e8, getting out of the pin preemptively so that I can play e5. And then if d5, you can go knight a6, knight c5, kind of like we did in the king. So let me now see if I can pull up a game where we, you will be able to see a very similar concept. Uh, oh, I see already several possibilities. Now, oh, here's a beautiful one. Here is a beautiful one, guys, from a pretty high-level game, 2300. So what I'm showing you, serious players are, uh, you know, they... So this is a King's Indian game in which literally all of the ideas we just applied were applied by this by, by, by a pretty good player. So this is a game between two Russian players, uh, pretty competent. You guys can see 2192 was black, 2332 was white. Watch. Now... Petrosian variation, literally the same position we had. White played bishop g5 first. Here's b6, right? I'm not making this stuff up. These are legitimate ideas. And black actually provoked f3. Here's knight h5. And here black did something very interesting. He played bishop f6. Preparing to, to get the bishop to g5, weakening white star squares. White captured the pawn. And black still played bishop g5. And here white made the, the decisive mistake. Bishop takes f8. Who can tell me what black did in this position? Boom. Boom. And now, boom. But here, you s careful guys, you have to apply the concepts in a smart way. Because the move queen g4, queen h4, there's knight f1, by the way. Queen h4 immediately here, there's knight f1. And now all of a sudden white defends. So it's not queen g5. There's a better way of doing this. And you always have to look for the executions that are suited to the position. When you're applying a pattern, guys, very, very important. Don't autopilot the execution of an idea. All right. Queen g5, knight f1 is a little bit less clear. Queen takes f8, knight f1, queen h6, knight g6. And now black found the showstopper. What's the final move of the combination? This is a slightly more difficult position to execute this in. Very zen. King g7. And once again, you can go rook h8, but the beautiful mate is takes and rook h8, winning the game. White's only way to stop this would be g4, but then just rook h8. And white resigned in this position. Now so here's how a 2300 fell prey to precisely the sequence of moves. So you see, this stuff is real, this stuff is applied, and it's applied in games between pretty good players. Whoops, speed run. All right. Let's do one more. What if, what about King F1? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh King Ah, uh, there was King F1, there was I think Queen H4. That was <laughs> a terrible game. Like, oh yeah. Okay, let's do one more. Yeah, White certainly didn't play well, by the way. Make no mistake. White White did not have a good day. He shouldn't have taken the rook. That was a mistake a 2300 uh shouldn't make, but they do. I mean, they, they make them. <laughs> they make them too. Everybody's human. Yeah, um, I'm on a roll today. Careful. Let's go. Yeah, I know. I know. So, oh, we're playing the same guy we played last time who be almost beat me. Okay, so let's play an accelerated. We're playing chess Lebanese. Salah who was at tw 2100 and almost beat me the last time. Okay, so we're going to take and play the accelerated. And he's going to play the Morozzi by the best line that White has. Now here, let me actually think about this for a second. What we're going to do, we're going to play the move, we're going to play the move d6. I'm going to show you guys a pretty cool system against the accelerated. Now normally, black develops to g7 with the bishop, but I like a more rare system that I think is dangerous, but he actually finds the right way to skirt it. Bishop e3. Wow. This guy is the real deal. Oh, I should have gotten knight f6 actually. Okay, whatever. We'll just transpose into the main line. I, I, I messed up the move order. We have to transpose into the main line. Um, we have to transpose into the main line. Okay, knight f6. And I'm going to show you guys some of the key ideas of the accelerated dragon. I'm assuming that he doesn't know this that well. Now, the Morozzi bind, in my opinion, if white wants to get an advantage against the accelerated, he should play the Morozzi bind. That's really the only very very testing system against the accelerated and uh let's see how well he knows the ideas now 
how do we understand? I'm gonna, because this guy is underrated and really, really good, uh, I ask for you guys' understanding. I'm going to play a little bit faster, and I'm going to play maybe with a little bit less explaining than usual. And then after the game, I'll be sure to compensate. Now, right now, we're just going to develop our bishop to d7. So far, we've just been developing our pieces. There's nothing to explain. Basically, Black's idea is to play on the queen side. And in order to play on the queen side, Black will have to, Black will have to operate according to the following formula. First and foremost, you need, to, you need to grab space on the queen side. Okay? But in order to grab space, we need to refocus our pieces a little bit. Let's take on d4. And where do you guys think we'll put this bishop on d7? Where will we put this bishop on d7? We should put it on c6, all right? That's just a good solid square. And when I say grab space on the queen side, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we'll need to play a5, a4, and that will allow us to put that clamp down on the queen side so that we can then deploy our queen to a5 and start attacking him. This is white is slightly better here, according to the computer. Objectively, white is better. No doubt about it. White's got more space. He's got the central control. But, but in my experience, this is hard to play uh, accurately for a human being. Knight e5 is good. Knight e5 is a good move. Now let me think here for a moment, uh, because I myself don't play the accelerated full time, so this is this is new to me as well. Okay, so we're gonna take that knight with a bishop, and after the game, I will explain uh, why I did that, like fully. But, but there is a reason behind it. Let me just write this down. Now, what pieces do we want to trade? His pawns, his pawns are on the light squares. What do we want to trade? If And I'll be more specific. Which of the two bishops do we want white to give up? We want white to give up the dark squared bishop because the light squared bishop is kind of lame, right? A lot of the pawns are on the same color as his bishop. I don't put a lot of stock in that principle. But here it's a good idea to apply. Now, I, I see you guys thinking, well, wait a second. R, isn't it weakening to give up our fianchetto bishop? Isn't that bad? Look, it's not great. That's a concession, right? But there's not that many pieces left in the first place. So uh, in my estimation, it's not like he'll be able to attack my king. Furthermore, okay, it goes f4. That's an interesting move. And a very, I think a very good one. He expands preemptively on the king side. So he will try to attack us on the king side, should we give up this bishop. Well, I have no choice. I kind of have to give up this bishop. Uh, otherwise, my whole strategy with 97, my whole campaign is just not that good. And we have a decision to make. Do we trade queens? Queen b6. Unfortunately, conceptually, this is good. Uh, concretely, this is bad because if queen takes b6, knight takes b6, and the rook penetrates to c7. So let's look at this knight for a second. It's stuck in no man's land. Where can we put it? King's Indian style with Nazi 5, girl. And what move does this open the possibility of in terms of expanding on the queen side? In terms of expanding on the queen side, what is now possible? We can play... Yeah, we can play a4, but... Um, we can play a4, but that's, that's missing... Well, actually, yeah. We will play a4. We, why? Why? First of all, we're grabbing space. Second of all, what he wanted to do, very sneaky guy that he is, is play a4 himself and cement that bishop, that splinter in our throat. At least the bishop is now stuck and it's not as well defended. How should we attack that bishop? How should we attack that bishop? We can play queen a5, but I like queen b6, which creates a standoff between the queens. And I feel like I like the standoff because I'm in control of it. The piece that's between two pieces, if it's protected by a pawn, that's a pretty specific principle, but I think it might be a good one. If you have a standoff between two pieces and the piece in, in the middle of it is your piece and it's protected by a pawn, you're usually in control of that standoff, which means I'm usually the one here who is going to decide whether and if to trade queens, which is a pretty powerful thing to do. Uh, well, before I can unpassant him. Okay. So let's improve our position. How can we do that? Could somebody name a simple improving move, bringing a piece into the game? Yeah, rook, rook c8, rook a c, rook fc. This further supports the knight, which I like. And uh, I would have also considered playing a3. Okay, so he goes king, a very good move. Very good move. And now I want to continue expand. I'm going to go queen b4. This is a very sneaky move um, because I want him to play a3. 
I want him to play a3. And why do I want it to play a3? Because it weakens something. What does the move a3 weaken? Could somebody answer me this question while he's thinking? The b3 square. And I could potentially fork him on that square. So he goes e6. Okay, let me calculate for a second. Aha. Uh -huh. So if we go to the... I'm, I'm just uh, calculating a little bit here. There's some really cool, cool lines. Ooh. So what can we do here? What we can do is we can play the immediate move b5. And this is not that simple as it seems. It seems like we're winning the bishop because the bishop can't move because of the But what can he do? Dude, 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 what can he do? Dude, dude. What can he do? And I'm gonna I'm gonna pre-move rook takes f7 check. What can we do? If we move the queen, then what the hell did we do this for? So what's the tactic? Who sees it? I think we have a beautiful idea. Knight b3. Now there's two things we're exploiting here. If he takes the knight, I take his queen. And if he takes my queen, I take his. And look at the superiority that we now have. Uh, our knight is guarding b5. We've got pressure on all at all angles here. We play rook takes f7. Once his bishop moves, we're going to take his rook, take the pawn on f4, and we're going to have a winning endgame. So... Um, which which we'll have to win by playing precisely. Once again, I have to give big props to my opponent. He's really, really good, but it seems like he's going down here. We're going to take the pawn, and now we need to reassess the situation. How are we actually going to specifically win this position? Well, we're going to go after his queenside pawns, and with that in mind, where should we put the rook? Where should we put the rook? And this should come automatically to you guys, but now there's actually several ways to do it. Yeah, rook f2 is correct. Attacking the pawn, forcing his rook to get passive. And now we're just going to grind him down here. We're going to grind him down. Now, one very important principle I've shared with you guys many times in the past. Never stop looking for tactics, no matter how many pieces are left on the board. One, two, and that's exactly what you guys are doing. Checkmate on h2. I think we actually played a super nice game. I'm curious to see... What are what are I? I don't usually do this, but I'm actually curious. I feel like I'm into this game, and we're two thousand. Yeah, eighty-eight point three, not that good. You never know what your accuracy is. Sometimes you feel good, great, you don't play well, vice versa. Okay, let's analyze. I I don't think it likes the accelerated. Now, the line that I was going to actually play starts with knight f six. I was going to recommend this line where you get the queen to d4 so that when you fee in keto you create the extra but i'm not going to talk about that right now we transitioned into the main line of the accelerated now as you guys know uh black is cramped right that's the, the main appeal of the morozzi is is white clamps down on black center making me essentially move around on the first three ranks that's not to everyone's liking but i like these kinds of openings so we take on d4 reposition the bishop, and we start expanding on the queen side. Our idea is to go a5, a4, and then queen a5. And I actually think his move was a bit of a positional error. And um, the reason why is that he's trading a lot of pieces, and from a space advantage perspective, that's not the wisest thing to do. But it's also not the wisest thing to do, because he's going to leave himself with a pretty lame bishop. Now, here's the thing. In these positions, can I ask you guys this, this following question? Could a case be made for the move e takes d5? Is Does this move contain any kind of sense? And I'll tell you preemptively, black is, is doing well here, but I want to use this uh, opportunity to make an instructive, what I think is a pretty instructive point. What is the case that could be made for this move? Yeah, Miso Subir, you're correct on here. The seven pun is weak, and there, oh, there's a classical game that is shown to all Russian-trained schoolboys, if you want a little sneak preview to the Russian school of chess. This is shown to every little Russian schoolboy. Every schoolboy does the And watch this, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'm going to run through this game very, very quickly. This is not a famous game. I don't think many of you know this game. And I don't mean to be condescending when I say that. I just It's just not a very famous game unless you've been trained in the Russian tradition. Botvinnik against Holodkevich. Botvinnik was 16 when this game was played. He had learned chess at 12. And while this is not an accelerated dragon, you get the same exact structure. Look at the Morozzi structure and guess what happens? Knight d5, knight takes d5, e takes d5. Not c takes d5, but e takes d5. Now, I want you guys to look at this and tell me what is the main difference between this position and e takes d5 in my... Why didn't I say the black was fine in my game, but he's not fine here? Because no knight. The key is that there is no knight. I'm asking not specifically and... Henry good, yeah. So the key is that there is no knight in the C file. Well, the C file is closed there too. Um, the knight in such a position can take all these outposts and it can essentially slice off the artery to the E7 pawn. And that is the whole difference. Black has this lame, dark squared, light squared bishop. And the result of this is that white just piles up on the E file. Look how classically he, he does this. Now he pressures the queen, so he drives the pawn to B6, cements it. Tr trades off the rook on the c-file black's only trump card now he gets one, a rook of his own to the c-file and he finishes the game with what very pretty idea this ends the game and it's very fitting where this occurs because that's the whole bottom line point of this strategy queen e6 check if you don't trade queens white takes and promotes if you do d takes e6 and b7 and Botvinnik will promote his pawn. The pawn is actually unstoppable. Botvinnik against Kholodkevich. Very famous game. Well, to Russian uh, players. And you can see the idea very clearly defined here. Okay? Now you guys are all familiar with it. And I'm actually very happy. I'm really pumped that you guys are now aware of this game. So let's compare that to this position. It seems very similar. But this knight could be either on e5 or on c5. Uh, promoting the queenside pressure. And that makes all the difference. Okay? So at this level, when we when we hit 2000, uh, it, it's all about making these subtle observations. Again, the method of comparison, comparing one position to another position, what is different? That helps you understand and categorize imbalances. Um, and that really builds your positional understanding. When you're able to look at a position and detect the key difference, uh, then you get better at evaluating these kinds of positions, okay? So he played C takes D5. We take on d4, but, and again, if we go queen b6 here, then uh, this would be a good trade were it not for rook c7, very concrete. And he goes, so knight c5, bishop b5, a4, very important move. Otherwise, he goes a4. Now we put, put play queen b6. We improve our position with rook c8. We pin the bishop with queen b4. By the way, a3, my intention was to go knight b3 anyway. And... Uh, the queen trade, as we kind of saw in the game, is beneficial for us. Now, we could have locked everything up with f5 first. That would have been sensible. But here I calculated some lines. So had he taken first and gone a3, we still go knight b3. And this, um, it does matter which rook goes to c8. How did I decide rook a c? Because rook fc8 would have abandoned the king. And I'm not saying I would have paid the price for it. But something like f5 at some point could have been very scary. At least here I keep a little security detail on my king. Right? Does that make sense? A little bit of a general answer, but hopefully that that's how I decided it. Now, here there's a couple of important details. If he moves his queen away, reinforcing the attack on my queen, there seems to be a pretty big problem. This is what I had to see. If I move my queen away, he takes the knight and he wins a pawn. But what key resource does black have here? What key resource does black have here? Um... One sec, I'm writing down this, this, uh, which rook, yeah, queen c5 is very important, or queen d2, uh, and, uh, this is fine, and I calculated this, that line doesn't end there, bishop takes b5, but it's only here the black demonstrates the important resource, rook to b8, attacking the bishop, winning b2, so without this move, and that's what it boils down to, white would have been better. So I calculated this, he made it easy for us by trading immediately, and his position just collapses. We take, take, and now we go knight f3 with a checkmate. Is it knight d2 stronger? Uh, maybe, not sure. Queen d2 is also good. 
So the, the, the server is restarting. Uh, so I'll take this opportunity to talk briefly about a question that bothers a lot of people, which is, um, any questions, by the way, which is which rook to put on a particular core? How do you decide? What is the decision logic that you can apply, um, that you can apply in deciding which rook to put on a particular square? Now, well, you do have coin flip, exactly. So there's a couple of things. The sort of baseline method that I, well, 2g6 allows queen takes d4, which is a separate line. Um, the baseline method that I, um, that I propose to apply is to think about when you decide which rook to put on a square and you have a candidate move, you look at the other rook. You always look at the rook that's left out from a square. And in doing so, you try to assess whether that other rook will have any prospects uh, or not. Because oftentimes, so that's like method number one. And then method number two, you always have to factor in future ideas. So method number one, you try to find a position for both rooks. Uh, you don't just myopically look at one. The second concept is you need to figure out what your long-term ideas are. And long-term ideas can involve keeping your king safe as well as your opponent's long-term ideas. And sometimes it's very important for one rook to be in charge of being able to promote a long-term idea. Maybe that idea will occur 15 moves down the line, but that could be a very viable reason to keep a rook on a particular square. Uh, so those two things I would say uh, formula, you know, sort of form the main basis for deciding, but every situation is different and I don't want to oversimplify. This is a very, uh, you know, this is a very serious question. So for example, Let's do, let's do some very, very quick practice in this. Just one, one example. And this is going to be kind of tricky. So bear with me, please. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's apply this logic precisely here with one of my games from 2017, my worst tournament ever. I dropped like 30 points, but I did win round one. So in this position, my opponent plays queen takes queen. JQ NLS, thank you for the prime. Which rook should I recapture with? Rook A takes D1 or rook F takes D1? Let's think about this for a second and I'd like somebody to raise your hand, just kidding, to make a case for which rook. So I'm gonna try to gauge the crowd here. Some of you think F, most of you think A. Let's play the... Um, you know what I'm going to play here? Beautiful time for this. This, this. I'll give you guys another 15 seconds. All right. This is very fitting music. All right, so the answer is rook a takes d1. And I wanna make it clear that the difference here is marginal. But not everybody has detected the reason properly. The queens are off the board. So there's no reason to, there's no reason to like, think that black is going to ever attack my king. Black is not going to attack my king, uh, most likely. So it's not that I need the rook to defend the king. But I asked myself, where can I put this f rook? And I, what I, suspected would happen is that he would take the pawn on e5 and i would respond with bishop takes c5 but forecasting this uh into the future i recognize that the e-file might get opened and guess what it would be perfect to put this f rook on the e-file if i had taken with the the f rook then the other rook would have to choose between these closed files and i never really anticipated any one of them opening in the near future so what happened i played knight d5 here Boom, 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 the E file opens, and I didn't end up putting the rook on E1, but that's that's completely beside the point. The point is I had this idea in mind and it, it actually influenced his play and I won the game in the end. Okay, not the ideal example, but uh, hopefully it, it clarifies things for you guys a little bit. Exactly, thank you. I can't wait for him to get older so he slows down a little. Well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep things swift so it's entertaining, but 
as I always say, if there's something that you don't understand specifically, I always encourage questions. If you'd like me to repeat something, that doesn't mean you're dumb. It means you're invested in learning and I will never take it that way. And nor should anyone else. Uh, that's the whole point of this in the first place. Absolutely, Ryan. So are you asking what plan I'd have here or something specific? Go ahead. I always um, disagreed with people who get annoyed when people repeat questions, as long as it's not in a trolley way. Uh, because it just means people want to make sure they understand something. Yeah, Ryan, I'm, I'm uh, all ears, so let me... Well, I can use the opening, but I don't know what to do after that. Oh, so how do you plan in general is your question? Yeah, so one of the biggest misconceptions about planning is that when like beginners think of grandmasters, they think of GMs having these 15, 20 move plans, these long, like major plans. And that's actually incredibly Toxorm with five gifted. Thank you. Toxorm. Really appreciate That's a misconception. Mostly plans are two, three, four moves maximum. And that's why I define the three move rule to say that any idea that takes longer, three moves or longer is oftentimes going to be unrealistic uh, because the position changes so fast in most cases at a grandmaster level that most plans consist of small maneuvers. I want to trade this one piece. I want to do this one small thing, right? It's like running an errand. You're not planning for the rest of your life. There are exceptions to that. Sometimes the position can be completely closed, for example, and you can afford to make a 10 move plan, but those situations are definitely the exception rather than the rule. Okay, 4375. I cannot believe it. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cesar. Uh, something like 50, 14, 1500. I don't play pull up like this. How do you determine whether a move is too passive? No formula, but you have to make a judgment call. Is it more important to defend your king or more important to just start attacking? Definitely, Ryan. 100%. They're 15 minute games, 30 minute games, minimum. Uh, not that many. I'll answer questions since the server is resetting, guys. Now is your chance to ask some questions. I don't. Memorize entire games, though. Thank you, Phillipsburg. Well, I've done previous streams where I talk about openings, and I'll do that sort of separately. Why was playing King H8 a good preemptive move? Well, because it got the king out of the diagonal. King H1 um, got the king out of the A7, G1 diagonal, so Queen B6 wouldn't create discover check ideas. So in the same-ish, um, and this is the reason the same-ish... Um, it's 1 a.m. in California, but it's 4 a.m. in North Carolina, which is the important part. So in the same-ish, you usually um, castle queenside, which is what makes the same-ish quite unique among King's Indian openings. Usually in the King's Indian, white castles kingside. In the same-ish, in most cases, white actually does castle queenside and go for checkmate. So it's a very dangerous line. 